Hello and welcome to this podcast today. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and this is one of the many podcasts we do that look at global, national and local issues. And we've got Dan Scribidior with us today. Now Dan is someone who lives in China. He's lived there for a little while now because he went there for his job, but he's been there through the, the pandemic and beyond. So we're going to talk about his, his experiences of being there. So, you know, welcome um, to this webinar, Dan, and I'm really pleased that you're, you're able to do this. So maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose to live in China, where you live and how long you've been there. Okay, well, uh, that's a good place to start, I guess. I've um, been here in Shanghai uh, coming up to five years now. Uh, first moved out here uh, towards the end of 2015, uh, simply because I was offered the opportunity uh, that seemed too good to refuse at that time. Um, sent a CV and a cover letter out to a, a friend of a friend and uh, didn't expect to hear anything back from it. But uh, I heard back a couple of months later from the organization that I'm currently with, um, inviting me out to China to discuss uh, the opportunity of working here. So uh, one thing led to another. Uh, I accepted the opportunity uh, initially for period of a year, but um, I seem to have got stuck here, um, which of course meant that uh, I was still here uh, this year at the outbreak of the pandemic. So um, the work is in exhibitions. Uh, we organize major uh, conferences and international shows. Um, so as you can imagine, the work has been rather impacted this year uh, by the outbreak um, but before then it was a uh, uh, very interesting uh, day to day since then it's been uh, rather challenging but um, uh, I guess I can't complain um, okay Okay, I mean, I mean, that gives us some idea of, you know, why you went there. But when you went there, first of all, having coming from a, a Western country, was it sort of difficult to adjust? Did you suffer any sort of culture shock? Um, initially, it was very different um, out here, even uh, within Shanghai, which is arguably one of the most international of the uh, Chinese cities. Um, if you compare the overall population here of 28 million to the expatriate population, uh, which only numbers Japanese and Koreans included as a uh, little under 200,000, at least that was the case when uh, I arrived here, it's still a very small amount. Um, within my organization, even though it's a uh, joint venture between a British company and a Chinese state-owned enterprise. I'm the only uh, foreign individual in the company. I work alongside about 50 other uh, Chinese members of staff. And um, so, so what? So what? Sort of what challenges did you face? First of all, I mean, what sort of so the differences did you see that you had to adjust to? Uh, cultural differences. So um, I did get given quite a bit of advice uh, before coming out and uh, I've been very fortunate enough to have some very uh, warm and understanding colleagues as well. So I certainly got given a uh, helping hand in moving over here. Um, but I have to say the international outlook of this place has been uh, very helpful as well, um, as well as my own temperament. So I've always been a pretty open person, uh, very accepting of different backgrounds, beliefs and uh, ways of thinking. Um, so this really helped me out in getting uh, my two feet uh, on the ground here. Um, in navigating uh, the differences in outlook and perspective. And what were those differences? 
Um, generally, uh, it's a question of attitude, I'd say. More than anything, I think uh, uh, here, does tend to have a bit more of a collective and communal uh, feel to it. Obviously, uh, living in a uh, communist country, uh, there is a certain uh, way of doing things, um, which is different from in the West, where I'd say uh, it's a lot more individualistic. So um, that was a key difference. Um, uh, generally speaking. But uh, all told, I don't think, uh, apart from the initial period of, uh, of adjustment, um, there's too much to uh, really uh, uh, overcome. Okay, so you, you, you've you been there for a while and you, you were there before December and the pandemic started there at the end of December, right at the end. Um, and, um, you know, you've lived through it, but when did you yourself hear about it first and realize there was a problem? Well, it's interesting actually, because um, we had news of it uh, in January. We already had our holidays booked. So I was going with uh, my wife, her parents, and my parents on a planned 10-day uh, holiday to Myanmar um, had been planned for months. And on the day we left China, uh, it was the day that they locked down Wuhan. So uh, we were hearing the news on the way to the airport. Uh, we were fully briefed at that time as to the uh, precautions. So we were wearing masks through the airport and on the plane and uh, taking care to wash our hands and all of that but it really blew up um, while we were in Myanmar, um, which led us to waylaying our flights and uh, returning to China a little bit later than initially planned. Um, first off, uh, the Chinese New Year here, everyone gets uh, seven days of annual leave. Um, Chinese government, the authorities, took the decision to extend that by 10 days for the whole country as a precautionary measure. So no one went back to work during that time. And for people stuck in the country at home, that was essentially an extended uh, staycation. Um, for us, we were quite fortunate. It meant that we uh, got our holiday extended a little bit. But um, on coming back, into China on the 10th of February. Um, it was uh, quite marked how uh, the situation had changed from when we left. So uh, even landing, coming into, into Shanghai, we got our temperature checked uh, about three times um, before getting in the taxi. Um, we had to fill out a load of forms, had to download a special app, basically uh, giving a uh, health check. So we had to uh, say that we hadn't been in touch with anyone from Wuhan knowingly in the last two weeks, uh, that we hadn't experienced uh, temperature or any illness and um, uh, things like that. Um, so did the... So do you think when you went there, I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, did you understand when you went there how serious it was? And when you got there, did you think the, the Chinese were quite prepared and with track and trace and so on, they had got a fairly sophisticated system? Mm. Um, definitely. Uh, once the cat was out of the bag, so to speak, the authorities here acted very decisively uh, in containing uh, the outbreak and implementing uh, precautionary measures to ensure that uh, the spread was minimized. Um, and this was all over the country. So uh, I was very impressed with the way that they did get a handle on it uh, following the initial outbreak in so, as I was saying, when we got back 
to China on the 10th of February. Um, following the airport, this, these precautions went all the way down to the community level. So even though we got back at that midnight or something to uh, the local community where I live, still had to fill out a load of forms with them as well. Had to fill out more forms with uh, my company, with the uh, local authorities, with the building management uh, of the office that my company is based, and uh, online as well. Basically saying the same thing as uh, health check measures. Um, also did voluntary uh, quarantine, so did not leave the community for two weeks. Uh, we were allowed deliveries, but uh, at that time all deliveries, food deliveries, uh, postal deliveries came to the front of the community. Everyone in masks uh, and um, that was the case for the whole of my company as well. Uh, measures varied uh, depending on where you lived. So I know some expats uh, had a lot more uh, of a challenging situation than me. They were uh, confined to their apartments for the quarantine period and weren't allowed to go out into the community. But uh, for uh, me... In, in the West, uh, and particularly in the UK, people, certainly the government, didn't take it seriously at the beginning. They thought it was some sort of flu, uh, and they've admitted mm. that. And China clearly didn't. But what did happen in the UK was once it happened, there were a lot of people who were at home alone, elderly people, and a huge voluntary sort of army began to emerge that would go out and deliver food. Did that happen in China? How were those people who were isolated? How did they get their food? Was it done through local authorities, through the state? Or did they have a voluntary response as they did say in the UK? Um, things do work uh, differently here. So there was a lot more of a community response. Uh, the way uh, uh, society is organized here, there's a measure of responsibility that goes all the way down to the community level. Uh, the equivalent in London would be, uh, I don't know, neighborhood watches or something like that. But there's a lot more uh, of an active presence uh, here. So just speaking from my perspective, uh, communities really came together and helped those uh, in more vulnerable situations. So um, in terms of uh, food supplies and stuff like that, uh, uh, it, there's a difference here in that uh, food deliveries are a lot more uh, ubiquitous, I think, than uh, uh, in the UK at this point, uh, everything is uh, very easy in terms of the delivery mechanisms. So, um, uh, oh, that, so, that, didn't. so, so those community um, inputs, you know, you said it's a bit like Neighbourhood Watch, except in this mm -hmm. country, Neighbourhood Watch is voluntary. It's not right across the country. But I guess mm -hmm. in the Chinese system, they set it up everywhere so that they could link into that and make it respond incredibly fast. Whereas in our case, you know, there was a gap between the problem and a solution. Mm. Uh, that's correct. So in terms of that level of organization, it was extremely uh, responsive. And that level of responsibility was delegated down to the community level, which is why different communities sometimes had more or less strict uh, preventative measures in place for those coming uh, from outside of the country or uh, from uh, affected areas. Also, because of the level of uh, technological development here and connectivity, it was very easy to get uh, the track and trace set up without too much additional effort. So, um, very quickly, after all the registration processes, everyone here has uh, health QR codes on their phone. And uh, I need my health QR code to enter the bank uh, when things were still at a high risk level, needed them to enter uh, uh, shopping malls or other public buildings. 
um, and equally uh, strict measures were put in place to check uh, temperatures and stuff like that. So um, even yeah. now entering my office block, I get my uh, temperature taken um, on the uh, way in. So the track and trace system pretty well started in China straight away, did it? I mean, it was, there was no gap. They had, they had the infrastructure there, whereas here it took a long time and people are still saying we haven't got it right. Indeed, um, I'd heard about that, but uh, in terms of the UK situation, I think uh, once the cat was out of the bag, it was going to be an uphill struggle, really. And uh, here they really started things at source so very early on but this again is because they had a lot of the uh, technological uh, infrastructure and capacity for this in place already. It is the re part of the reason for that that China is way ahead of us and most other people in terms of digital technology and did that help at all? Um, it certainly did. Um, in terms of the development that uh, I've experienced, even over the last uh, five years, it's just remarkable the pace of change that uh, I've witnessed here. And people are a lot more open to uh, this new technology, really. Um, so for me, just got a couple of... Uh, apps, WeChat and LeapPay. With that, with those two apps, I can pay for everything from my morning coffee to my utility bills to a meal in a restaurant or uh, any delivery really. And it's that level of connectivity that uh, made um, it a lot more responsive in this uh, crisis situation as well because uh, logistically um, it made a lot more possible from food deliveries to uh, organizing. Do you think that's something to do with the different political systems that exist in the West in Ch and in China or is it to do with a cultural difference that uh, Chinese people are more interested in the long term and they plan more mm. in detail and in a more sophisticated way? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, when it comes down to it, I think a key factor here is uh, trust in the systems and in government or uh, in the technological advances in general. I think uh, in the West, uh, the take up of things like mobile payments or linking uh, your bank accounts to your phone uh, has been slower so the pace of change there has been slower. I think a certain amount of that is down to uh, financial regulation as well. Here um, uh, rather differently uh, the financial regulation um, hasn't been as heavy which has allowed companies like Tencent and WeChat and uh, 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 Alibaba, who own the Alipay app, um, have been able to take advantage of that and put in place uh, payment infrastructure that has made all of this possible. Um, that, along with China being the manufacturing base of the world, means that technology here is incredibly cheap as well. You can pick up uh, standard a uh, basic smartphone for the equivalent of uh, about £50 pounds or less. Um, so that really makes it affordable for pretty much everyone. That's, um, that, that's quite amazing. The, the, the other yeah. thing that we noticed when the outbreak took place in China was when you saw them on the television, everyone was wearing a mask right from the beginning. Mm. Whereas in this country, it's taken quite a while to get people to wear masks and they're there are even some people now who won't do it for libertarian reasons and they make up all sort of health reasons maybe to justify it. Um, mm. Did you notice that difference and do you understand why there is that difference? It, it, in, in my view, it comes down to trust 
again. And uh, again, what I was uh, mentioning before in terms of the cultural difference, uh, collective mentality uh, versus the more individualistic mentality um, in the West. Uh, so when the authorities here advised everyone to wear masks and gave good justification for it in the uh, form of the epidemic at that time, uh, there was no hesitation in terms of masks here before. I have to admit I wore a mask on occasion on my morning commute more for the pollution here than the uh, 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 disease prevention angle. But um, even uh, even then, there were still quite a few people wearing masks uh, just uh, to prevent against the common cold and stuff like that. Uh, I think um, China and other Eastern countries' experience of previous pandemics uh, was a major factor in that as well. Going through SARS, for instance, um, what was it, 15, 18 years ago, um, was a very important precursor because it gave uh, the countries here um, good uh, experience in dealing with this and understanding how serious it could be. Obviously, this is on a whole different level, but uh, it was that previous experience that really got the authorities to take it a lot more seriously from the word go and effectively as a result. Okay, just to move on to, to another area. I mean, you're living in China, you've seen this country grow, you've seen the economic growth, you've seen the population grow. Um, I mean, do you think China is a stage where it's sort of re-establishing its place in the world in a way that um, it hasn't for the last two centuries? In a way, in the last two centuries, it's been humiliated, whereas before that, it was the middle kingdom, the center of the world. Do you think it's beginning to see itself in that position again now? Uh, definitely. I think there's uh, an awful lot of uh, pride in the renewed uh, and growing status of China in the world. It's, uh, there's no question it's on the ascent. And in terms of the uh, uh, development that China has experienced over the past uh, 30 years or so, um, they've <laughs> accomplished some pretty impressive feats. They've uh, brought close to 900 uh, million people out of poverty during that time. Uh, they have seen an average of 6 to 10% growth consistently up until very recently. Uh, the uh, development of infrastructure here is just staggering. I've taken every opportunity to travel within China and uh, it never has ceased to impress me really in terms of the high-speed rail, in terms of the uh, infrastructure everywhere. Um, it's just on a different scale really. In uh, the time that the UK has been arguing over the development of the High Speed Rail 2. China has built uh, roughly 5,000 kilometers of High Speed Rail track uh, throughout the country. And by 2030, they're going to link every single major population center, over 250,000 people, uh, to this network. So um, it's really quite staggering. The uh, accomplishment and sense of accomplishment that that's brought as a result uh, here in China. It's um, also isn't it, a leader in alternative energy and solar power and wind power, particularly solar power. It's been going ahead at a huge pace. That is correct. Um, the authorities here have taken uh, climate change and uh, the challenge of the environment incredibly seriously. They've invested um, significantly as a result there, not just in uh, solar panel, uh, solar power and wind power, where I believe they're world leaders, but uh, also in hydroelectric, uh, tidal, and all sorts of alternative uh, energy 
uh, solutions. Uh, equally, uh, the electric car market here has just really taken off over the last uh, five years or so. So, whereas in the West, uh, people can just name Tesla, and that's about it. Here, uh, there are many electric car companies, and the electric uh, car charging network uh, has extended almost nationally at this point. So, in Shanghai, uh, you've got electric car charging stations pretty much in every parking lot. Um, the government subsidizes the installation of electric car charging uh, stations at your home. Uh, they subsidize the registration of vehicles and they also have subsidies for the electric car companies themselves. Um, in terms of public transport, uh, I think China has more electric buses than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that is uh, quite an achievement. It's always a little bit of an unknown to me why uh, this sort of technology hasn't been uh, pursued, pursued more in Europe and the West, because uh, it's uh, very... Uh, viable at this point. Do you think a part of the problem is that, um, you know, the West has been in a, a predominant position for two to three centuries, and now, including America, it's on relative decline, and we're seeing a growth in China, we're seeing a growth in India, and the West is finding it very difficult to understand, to understand that, and indeed come to terms with that. I agree there. Um, I think everyone understands it to a greater or lesser degree, but in terms of coming to terms with it, uh, that's another matter. Um, I'm a positive person. I have a rather optimistic view of the future, but I do realize that we're living in incredibly challenging times at this point. So my hope is that we are able to uh, effectively transition to a uh, balanced multipolar world order uh, within the years ahead. Um, we'll see <laughs> how it transpires, but uh, I do realize that there are certain hurdles to cross on the way there. Okay, one, one couple of questions before, you, before we go, because we're very close to time. Um, I mean, when, when I first knew you in Global Net 21, you were a great advocate, advocate of collaborative decision-making and you had a system to do that. Have you been able to pursue that and would it work in China? I have, and um, it's something that uh, could quite possibly work in China. Um, in terms of uh, my development of uh, these ideas while I've been over here. I have to admit that it's been something on the back burner, uh, mainly because work has been so uh, busy in organizing events uh, in general. Uh, but nevertheless, I have found the time to run a few workshops and talk to certain people about possibly developing it into an online application. Um, this is definitely something that I'm intending on focusing on more in the future. Um, but in terms of the way it acts to increase the level of conversation and get people listening to one another, uh, this is something that in my uh, experience here seems to transcend uh, the cultural differences really. Um, so it's my hope that it's uh, going to form a part of the solution in uh, <laughs> however limited a way um, as we move forward. I mean, you know, you, you can take extreme views as people do that maybe in China's communist system, they don't they'll go in for collaboration. Britain's a capitalist <laughs> system, they don't go in for collaboration. But what you're saying is it can work in both systems, yeah? In terms of uh, open discussion, that is the case. In terms of uh, certain spaces, uh, I think uh, it might be uh, seen as more of a challenge than others. But uh, from the way I've approached it here, 
in terms of neutral topics for discussion and debate. It certainly uh, seems to work to bring people together in terms of uh, official policy formation and decision making. Uh, I think that's a different matter, uh, but when it comes to it, um, it possibly could be uh, uh, pursued more uh, effectively in the West than over here. <laughs> okay, right. Well, we sort of come to the end of this. So tell me if anybody wanted to know more about China or more about the work that you do and your collaborative approach to decision making, where would they go? Um, they can feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or Facebook. You just have to search for my name. It's a rather unusual name, so it isn't too difficult to find me on. Um, and feel free to contact me directly. No uh, website at this present time. Okay. So that's the best way. Okay, well, thanks very much, Dan, for doing that. I mean, I think it's quite interesting because you have a perspective of the West and China as well. And I think you've told us a lot about China that maybe people here didn't uh, understand or didn't know. And I think that's been, you know, very, very enlightening. So, you know, thank you for doing it. And uh, it's no been problem. great to, to do the interview. So thank you, Dan. And um, uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll end this uh, interview now. Mm -hmm.